Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the second part of our four-part webinar series on CDAW's 2016 concluding observations. My name is Karen Campbell and I'm a program manager with the Canadian Women's Foundation and we're so pleased to be partnering with FAFIA today to uh, offer you this webinar series. Um, we noticed that there was really wide demand uh, to participate in these webinars and that really signals to us that women's organizations and human rights organizations across the country are interested in these international processes and how they influence Canadian policy and the lives of women and girls on the ground. Um, and so we're very happy to be able to host these conversations and to help to shine a light on the great work that FAFIA and its partners are doing. So welcome to everyone. Today we are going to talk about the most recent concluding observations that were released by the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, or the CEDAW Committee. Canada was reviewed by this committee in October of 2016, and the committee's recommendations on how Canada can improve its compliance with its international women's rights obligations were released in November of 2016. And ever since then, um, FAFIA, NWAC, and dozens of other organizations and individuals have been calling on the government to implement these essential human rights recommendations. This second webinar is meant to introduce you to the various international human rights bodies that FAFIA and NWAC have been engaging with um, in their pursuit of uh, furthering Indigenous women's and girls' rights. And specifically, uh, we're going to review the concluding observations from CEDAW's most recent review of Canada, um, and that review addresses Indigenous women's and girls' socioeconomic rights and their right to live free from sexist and racist violence, which is something that NWAC and FAFIA have been advocating for uh, in the international arena for over a decade. So we really hope that this webinar um, will give you a better sense of the root causes and systemic issues that result in Indigenous women's and girls' marginalization and uh, to help you to see how to use international bodies' reports and recommendations to promote the human rights of Indigenous women and girls. Um, but before we get started, I, I just want to cover a couple of uh, housekeeping items. So first of all, on the right-hand panel of your GoToWebinar application, you're, you'll see a box there where you can type questions. Um, please use this box if you'd like to pose questions to the presenters or if you're having any difficulties with technology. Um, online with me today, um, in addition to our presenters, is Kasha, um, who is an intern with us here at uh, the Canadian Women's Foundation. And between the two of us, we're going to try to address any concerns or questions that you're having, and we'll also so uh, moderate the questions for the presenters, um, which will uh, will open up at the end of the session. Um, so please definitely use that box if you have something to ask. And the second thing is that on that panel, you'll see a section with handouts that you can download for your reference. Um, there are two handouts there. One is a PDF copy of this uh, presentation, and the other has some useful resources um, and information that you might be interested in. And the third thing to note is that this session is being recorded and we will share the recording uh, of the session with all participants and um, people who are on our email list after the webinar is over. Um, we had a tremendous turnout for the first session of our webinar series on January 26th and that webinar provided a general overview of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and how NGOs can participate in the CEDAW treaty review process. It's a great resource uh, for NGOs that are interested in the CEDAW process and um, in a few minutes I'll um, put a link, uh, I'll share a link with you um, the, so that you can access that recording. After today's webinar, um, we'll be hosting two additional sessions, including one on March the 30th, where we will discuss women's access to legal aid and the struggles they face in the justice and criminal law system. And the fourth session will be on April 27th, where we will review the recommendations related to women's poverty and violence against women, as well as the need for a comprehensive response plan to address these issues. And we'll be sending out a registration email in the near future for those of you who are interested in those sessions. Like this webinar, the final two webinars will go into greater detail about some of the issues in the 2016 uh, CEDAW concluding observations. <laughs> 
And with that, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. Um, we have a number of speakers online with us today. Um, Jennifer Lord is a passionate and dynamic Métis woman, uh, originally from lac saint anne uh, near Edmonton, Alberta, um, who embraces her traditional roles as wife and mother. Jennifer has more than 10 years of experience in the field of ending violence against Aboriginal women. And you may be uh, already familiar with some of her advocacy work on missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls. Um, the October 4th Sisters in Spirit Vigils and the Faceless Dolls Project. She has studied at the University of Ottawa, she has a BA in, in History, and at Carleton University um, with an MA in International Affairs. Jennifer applies a client-centered approach to her work and encourages giving voice to those around us that are silenced or, or silenced. She is currently the Director of Violence Prevention at the Native Women's Association of Canada. Uh, Melanie Omenaho uh, has been involved in the uh, Women of the Métis National, uh, sorry, of the Métis Nation National Board on behalf of the Métis Nation of Alberta since 1999. Um, as the president of WMN, she attempts to make sure that the Métis traditions and culture are part of the initiatives that they move forward on. Melanie has a comprehensive knowledge and understanding of many of the issues facing Métis women. Uh, she is the past president of the Women uh, of the Métis Nation of Alberta and has raised awareness about the priorities um, of that community. She's been an advocate on issues such as violence against women, Métis women in the justice system, child welfare, Métis family and Métis women's health. She has worked to develop programs and advocate on behalf of her community uh, to affect change in uh, various social programs to better meet the needs of the Aboriginal community. She also received a Queen's Jubilee Medal and recognition for her work in education um, and Aboriginal youth and advocating for families involved with children's services. Third, we have Susie Dunn. Susie is the coordinator for the Canadian Feminist Alliance for International Action. She was called to the Ontario Bar in 2016 and is currently a Master's of Law candidate at the University of Ottawa. As a research fellow with the Equality Project, she examines how law and policy can help to create uh, equality enhancing spaces for young people online um, and she focuses on preventing uh, technologically facilitated violence against girls and other marginalized youth. She was the recipient of the 2016 Shirley Greenberg Scholarship to pursue uh, feminist research and advance women equality and prior to, uh, to attending law school, uh, Susie worked as a frontline worker supporting victims of intimate partner violence and sexualized violence. She has also worked with Northern Youth, helping them to fulfill their equality rights. And finally, uh, Lara corner Yo is a steering committee member of the Ca uh, Canadian Feminist Alliance for International Action. She's involved in FAFIA's women's rights uh, reporting to the United Nations treaty bodies and FAFIA's domestic initiatives through the Campaign of Solidarity with Aboriginal Women and the Step Up for Women's Equality campaign. Lara is in her final year of law school at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law and she has a bachelor's in political science and a master's in international human rights law. She's worked with human rights organizations in Canada and the US including Justice for Girls, Human Rights Watch, West Coast Leaf and Phys Physicians for Human Rights. So a very, very distinguished panel that we're excited to welcome today. Uh, and with that I will end my introductions and turn, the, uh, turn us over to Susie to get us started. Great, thanks for that, uh, that great introduction, Karen. Uh, so we're going to start off with a quick poll, just to get a sense of uh, who's working directly with Indigenous women and girls, or if your organization works on issues related to Indigenous women and girls. So feel free to click yes if you've worked with Indigenous girls, or, or no if you're, you're new to this area, so we can get a sense of who's on the line with us. Okay, that's great. It's looking like uh, the majority uh, of people who are on the line uh, work directly with Indigenous women and girls, and, and we have a few people who are, uh, who are not uh, directly working on these issues. So I'm going to take us over what we're talking about today. Uh, to begin with, we're going to have Jennifer and Melanie go over a lot of the important work that NWAC and the women of the Métis Nation have done over the, the last decade or so uh, in advancing Indigenous women's rights in Canada. 
They're going to follow that up with talking about some of the root causes of violence against Indigenous women and girls and address some of the systemic issues that result in Indigenous women and girls' socioeconomic marginalization. Following that, I'm going to go over uh, what NWAC and FAFIA have done and some of our history of engagement with international human rights bodies in advocating for improved governmental responses to the crisis of violence against Indigenous women and girls as well as their, uh, the socioeconomic conditions that they face. Finally, Laura is going to go over uh, the specific CEDAW concluding observations that address uh, Indigenous women and girls. And she's going to share some of the domestic action that women are, are, talk, are taking on right now to implement these uh, concluding observations and recommendations, uh, including uh, the new Step Up for Women's Equality campaign. And then at the end, hopefully, we'll have some time for questions and answers. Uh, so save your questions till the end, and, and hopefully, we'll have time to answer some. So I'll pass off the mic to Jennifer and Melanie to uh, talk to us about their organizations. Hi, everyone. It's great to be on here. Um, Melanie, I'll let you introduce Women of the Métis Nation first, and then I'll talk a little bit about NWAC. Hey, uh, Women of the Métis Nation is uh, an incorporated entity that represents Métis women from across the homeland, which is uh, uh, for people that may not know the Métis political part of this, it's actually Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC. And that's because that's where the uh, Métis of the, uh, of the Rupert's land governed themselves and, and began their existence. So that's the representation that we do. Uh, we work with Métis women in the communities at various levels, trying to ensure that Métis women's needs are identified. And uh, we've often been referred to as the forgotten people. So we, uh, we have our, our work cut out for us, and we have to be able to demonstrate in everything that we do that uh, we're not the forgotten ones. And we keep reminding them that we're still standing here and we're quite resilient, we're not going away. Uh, we've worked on the issues of violence against Indigenous women. We've been a, a key uh, push and force to uh, ensuring things like the National Inquiry. Uh, we've worked in the areas of socioeconomic uh, issues and barriers for Métis women, as well as we've worked on many economic development projects trying to assist Métis women into getting that hand up to be able to move forward on their own uh, enterprises. And uh, uh, that I'll just leave it there. We've existed since uh, the early 90s, but truthfully, we've only been incorporated since 2010, But and I will leave it there. Great. Thanks, Melanie. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Lord. I am also Métis from Alberta originally, but I live and work here in Ottawa for the Native Women's Association of Canada. NWAC, as many of you, I think, already work for uh, within Indigenous communities, so that's great. You're probably already familiar with Women of the Métis Nation and Native Women's Association of Canada. We were incorporated in 1974, so one of, we're one of the first officially recognized national indigenous organizations in the country. And what we do is we are the national voice of Aboriginal women. And when we say Aboriginal women, uh, I think we're a little bit behind the times in terms of that changing language. We really want to be population specific. So. Melanie and I here are both strong Otapemsmak women, Métis women, but we also want to acknowledge Inuit women who are represented by Paktutit Inuit Women of Canada, and I know a few staff members are on the call on the webinar today, so I'm really glad that they're participating as well. And then we have women of the Métis Nation that Melanie heads up as well. So the three of us together work really well together, but we also do our own population-specific work. So at the Native Women's Association of Canada, we're primarily a First Nations organization. We do do a little bit of uh, representation for Métis issues as well, as I am a Métis woman and we have lots of Métis working in the organization, but we do recognize fully the leadership of the Métis Nation as well as Paktutit. Um, in terms of a lot of the information or the work we do, it's very similar to what Melanie said. We do a lot of lobbying and advocacy work. We are responsible for policy papers. We also uh, do a lot of project funding, which uh, is a lot of toolkits. 
in the bio that was read earlier for me, some of the larger advocacy pieces that we've tried to do nationwide include October 4th Sisters in Spirit Vigils, which happen every year on October 4th, and those are grassroots-led and organized. We also have the NWAC Faceless Doll Project, which I hope many of you have heard of as well, which was really a hands-on project that was developed so that we could have indigenous community members but also our non-indigenous allies come forward and learn about this issue. What does it mean when we talk about missing and murdered indigenous women and girls? What are the root causes? And we'll talk about that in the next slide. But then really work together as part of reconciliation to say where are we going from here? And one of the ways we can do that is through CEDAW. So I'm really uh, appreciative that we've been invited. So in the next slide, let's go to that with the root causes. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty dense slide, so I'll let you guys look at it. There's also a great handout on the supplementary links page. There's for slide six, it says NWAC fact sheet on root causes that we put together a few years ago too. So if you want any more information, you can look that all up. You can also call me at the Native Women's Association of Canada, which you can find our contact info easily online if you want a little bit of background. But basically when we're talking about this issue, we're talking about the devaluing of First Nation, Inuit, and Métis women and girls in this country. And that's the biggest one. A lot of times when I'm working with um, community members and the media, they're saying, what are we talking about? And that's what it is. We're talking about the devaluing. And that can take many forms, as you'll see from the root causes slide here. We're looking at historical root causes, legacy of colonization. We're also looking at residential school systems and also very important to talk about Métis Day schools as well that were not originally part of the first mandate for the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but many Métis people, including my own family members, went to Métis Day schools and that's very important to talk about those pieces as well. We uh, look at also socioeconomic root causes and that's when for many years we were hearing these conversations around, oh, indigenous women are the poorest of the poor, the lowest of the low. And that was really a very harsh label for many of us to come out from because it really didn't talk about why we were in those situations and why there were these lack of ec education and lack of housing and what that meant and what it was called and really it's an impact of colonization and those systemic changes. So when we're looking at this and when we're talking about it, which CEDA does, we're talking about systemic changes, which are really difficult, I think, when we talk about our own governmental systems here in Canada, where, where they're looking for, you know, a long-term goal is change within three to five years. But we're actually looking to undo, when, as we celebrate Canada 150, we're looking to undo at least 150 years. But if we could go back a few more generations, that would be great for us as Indigenous women and girls in this country. So if there are any other specific questions about the root causes, let me know. This is dense material, but one thing, one message I do want you to take away is that we're talking about the devaluing of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis women and girls. And to be very specific when you talk about it, to mention our specific populations. Melanie, did you have anything to add to that? I know you've done a lot of work with child welfare in, in Alberta, which is fantastic. Uh, yeah, no, we, uh, one of the things that we uh, have done and we continuously do is identify that uh, as Métis women, we need to continue to push and forge ahead to be able to address some of the socioeconomic root causes. Uh, because in the studies and research that we have uh, had access to or have done ourselves, it demonstrates that women are more impacted than anybody uh, at, in, at the community level when a variety of things start to change. And uh, it generally means that uh, things have not been looked at through a gender lens and it creates more marginalizing of Indigenous women altogether. So uh, I know that we have a good working relationship with NWAC now and we and Pactuated, and I know collectively we're moving forward on all the same issues. As much as we have a distinct based process going on and we recognize that they're a little bit different for each one of those groups uh, just because of the, 
the nature of the of the process and what colonization did to each of us independently uh, but it doesn't change the fact that we need to change the racism and sexism that happens at, more to indigenous women than to any other sector of, of uh, our, our communities as we see them so uh, and until we change the attitude of people I, I think it's going to be hard to change some of the bigger issues related to Indigenous women. So I know we work really hard on that. And our children are overrepresented within the, uh, the system and the, within the child welfare system. And it is another form of residential school. So it's important that we continue to work on these issues. Thank you. That's great, Melanie. I really like how, you know, you're you're linking those two always together is that when we talk about the root causes we're also talking about systemic issues and that's really important for us as indigenous women because it's very difficult to separate those two because these policies are so ongoing and some of them just take different forms as Melanie is saying when we talk about residential school and Métis Day schools and now we talk about the child welfare system they're very similar pieces and those are the type of systemic changes we want to look at but it's great to come from that outside lens to say yes these are all very similar because the end result is our children are being taken from our families and our communities because of racism um, for the systemic issues you'll see on this slide really in the center of it it's forced cultural and ling linguistic losses community dislocations so for myself as a Métis woman my midshift is this is our, our language it's very limited it's something that I really have to go back and uh, work with my community to get that information and those losses are really felt deep with within me and then as a as a mother with two young Métis girls there is this responsibility that I have as well to make sure that we're going back to our traditions but in many times a lot of us don't have those connections to our community because of that forced relocation and because of many other policies if you don't have a proper housing or opportunities for jobs you need to leave your community and sometimes that meant you couldn't go back to it um, when you see some of these other issues on the slides you'll see lack of funding for social programs education violence prevention services that is very true especially when we look at some of the others talking about housing right we have for first nations women can apply for credits to own a house but one of the restrictions for example is that you have to live in that house for a certain number of years which means that if you're going to school or in a relationship or traveling for work and doing that, those realities don't always fit what we do and how we live and work in this country as First Nations, Inuit and Métis. So you can see that even though we do have some of these programmings that are available to us or violence prevention services, they don't have enough of a gender-based lens or a cultural specific and a culturally safe gender-based lens really that apply to us and allow them to be accessible by, by many of us. Again, if people have specific questions about specific areas that we're looking at around child welfare or policing and, and, and those kind of pieces, please ask them at the end during the questions and answers because we can look at a lot of that. And especially this last year, we've had a lot of issues with Val d'Or in Quebec with police issues that uh, really I'm, I'm glad to see in the media. I am very sorry for these communities, but they're coming forward now to just say enough is enough. And we see that time and time again over these years in our communities across the country of people speaking out about child welfare and about police. And the solutions they're looking for are these really recognizing these systemic issues and changing them. Yeah, I'm good. Melanie, do you have any other comments to add to that on systemic issues before we move on? Ashley, there's just a, a couple of little things, and I know that they're mentioned within the slide. Uh, education is a key important element uh, for changing the outcome of how uh, Indigenous women interact in the, in the social societies, and they need to be given the supports and resources necessary to ensure that they can have access to education, and that their children have access to quality education. 
And that isn't happening so much in our communities. And there's many examples of systemic issues within the education system that change how uh, our people and our, especially our children are able to succeed or not succeed in the school systems. And many of the programs around education are a hit and miss thing. There's no consistency. Uh, and I can even give you one example is if you have Indigenous children in a school and uh, they're identified as Indigenous children, very often the principals of the school will bring in uh, counselors and psychologists to assess and label those children so that they can get uh, additional funding for their schools. It has nothing to do with trying to uh, address the issues that are being identified. And many times the parents are not consulted on those uh, on those uh, various uh, labels and things that are being done. In fact, many of the parents don't even know that that's being done with the, their children in the schools. So, uh, and justice is the other thing. I know police are one issue, but the justice system itself does not treat or value Indigenous women. And very often when they're the victims of crimes, they're not consulted or talked to and, uh, and their issues are never really addressed. So they become victimized of a justice system as well. Thank you. Thanks, Melanie. So the, on the next slide, we're actually going to talk specifically about the Convention to Eliminate All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And we just want to get a sense of who participated in the last webinar. So we're going to pop up another poll just to get an idea of who, uh, who went through the first uh, webinar that we offered a month ago. So just go ahead and select yes or no on that one. Okay, that's great. We have a lot of new people here. 70% are, uh, are new and 30% uh, and saw the webinar last time. So for those 30% uh, of you that have uh, participated in the last webinar, this will be uh, old information. But for those of you who haven't, uh, hopefully it will be useful. So the United Nations created the, United, uh, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights in 1948. And since that time, it's developed several human rights treaties and declarations declarations, including CEDA, uh, that Canada's ratified. And so there's about 10 human rights treaty bodies that monitor the implementation of the different uh, human rights treaties. And so what that looks like is when a country signed on to a treaty such as CEDA, it'll be periodically reviewed by that treaty body uh, in order to assess its compliance with the treaty. So CEDA's treaty body consists of 23 experts um, who are experts in women and girls' human rights and it'll review Canada's compliance with CEDA about every four years. Its most recent review was in 2016, and both BAFIA and NWAC participated in that review. So what happens at a review is initially representatives from Canada's government and different civil society actors, including NGOs like BAFIA and NWAC, they'll submit reports to the committee uh, that'll speak to the status of women in Canada. And then uh, a while later, uh, people will travel to the United Nations in Geneva, where the CEDAW committee will speak to the government and will speak to the different uh, NGOs that are, that are there in person and ask them questions about Canada's compliance with CEDAW. And after this review is completed, uh, the committee will take the information they got from the reports and the information they collected at the in-person meetings in Geneva, and they'll use this information to inform their concluding observations. And what that is, is it's a report that summarizes the information they've heard, and it also includes specific recommendations on what Canada can be doing to improve its compliance with women's and girls' rights that are protected by CEDAW. And today, Laura's going to uh, take you over some of the specific recommendations that were made uh, precisely about Indigenous women and girls. And along with the, the CEDAW treaty, countries have an option of signing on to something called an optional protocol. And Canada signed on to this optional protocol. And what that protocol does is it allows individuals from Canada or groups to submit complaints or make requests for inquiries about grave or systemic violations of CEDAW to the committee. And so with complaints, uh, individuals have to have uh, exhausted all of the domestic remedies available to them before they can make a complaint to the UN. 
But for inquiries, those can be initiated by the committee as long as it has enough reliable evidence that a grave or systemic violation has, uh, has occurred. And so FAFIA and NWAC had uh, uh, filed a request for an investigation in 2012. And a, a bit of history on that. Um, so originally FAFIA brought the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls to CEDAW's attention in the 2008 review of, uh, of CEDAW. And they submitted a report to the CEDAW committee informing them about uh, this crisis that was happening in Canada. And the data was really shocking about the number of missing and murdered Indigenous women. And Fabia had provided a lot of information on just the dire conditions that Indigenous women and girls were living in. And when CEDAW received that information, it, it prompted them to urge Canada to address these issues as a top priority. And it asked Canada to report back on its progress uh, on dealing with these issues within one year. And so a year later, when Canada did report back, uh, the committee, the CEDAW committee found it wasn't satisfied with the lack of action Canada had taken to protect Indigenous women and girls. And so in, in 2011, NWAC and FAFIA decided to request that the committee initiate an inquiry under the optional protocol in the hopes that the committee would investigate the crisis in Canada. And the, the committee received this request and relying on information that had been provided to the committee in previous reviews, uh, the committee agreed that there was indications that there had been grave and systemic violations of Indigenous and women girls' rights that were protected under CEDAW. And so they, they formally initiated an inquiry in July of 2012. And Canada stalled uh, to begin with, uh, but eventually in 2013, CEDAW, the CEDAW committee was able to come to Canada to investigate this issue. And, uh, and following their investigation, they re released a report in 2015. And that report had some really important key findings and recommendations. So the report found that Canada's responses to disappeared and murdered Indigenous women and girls was uh, insufficient and inadequate. Canada's inaction and lack of support around this issue um, resulted in CEDAW finding a, a grave violation of Indigenous women and girls' rights. And so in the report, uh, they noted that the impacts of Canada's colonial legacy, along with inadequate police responses, demeaning stereotypes about Indigenous women and girls in Canada, and just the, the dire socio-economic conditions that were faced by Indigenous women and girls made them targets of violence. And this, this combination of the subjection to uh, assimilationist policy, police failures, and marginalization made Indigenous women and girls prey to perpetrators of violence. And so the report noted that the government's failure to act on this and to remedy the situation um, is a, and continues to be a breach of Canada's international human rights obligations. And so the report identified specific violations of Indigenous women and girls' rights, um, such as failing to ensure that police act in conformity with Canada's obligations under CEDAW, under Article 2D, and it made 38 concrete recommendations on how Canada could fulfill its specific human rights obligations that were, were due to Indigenous women and girls. Um, and, it, and it really urged Canada to take real action on improving the condition of, of these women and girls in Canada. Uh, but unfortunately, to date, the only recommendation that's been clearly implemented has been the launch of the inquiry into missing and uh, murdered Indigenous women and girls. And there's no real transparency around whether Canada has acted on the other 37 recommendations. And if you're, you're interested in, in reading what all of those recommendations are, you'll find a link to that report in the handouts. Uh, that's provided on the side of the, the webinar. In addition to reporting uh, to CEDAW and requesting an inquiry from them, uh, FAFIA and NWAC also looked to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And that, uh, that commission looked into women specifically in British Columbia because of the extraordinarily high numbers of women that were going missing or were murdered in British Columbia. And the province of British Columbia had actually initiated uh, the Provincial Missing Women's Commission of Inquiry. Uh, but unfortunately, women's, women's organizations and Indigenous organizations weren't financially supported in that process. And so they were forced to withdraw from participating in the commission. 
And so in the end, the provincial commission had, a, had little credibility within the indigenous community. And it was at a time when British Columbia was facing the highest rates of missing uh, and disappeared indigenous women and girls. Um, women were being murdered and uh, disappearing from the downtown east side in extraordinary numbers in Vancouver. Uh, for, for over a decade, indigenous women had been going missing or had been murdered on the uh, Highway of Tears in northern British Columbia, and nothing was being done to this issue. So Fafia and NWAC reached out to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to alert them about this, uh, about these disturbingly high numbers of women uh, in British Columbia. And what the commission is, is it's an arm of the Organization of American States whose mission is to promote and protect human rights in the American hemisphere. And Canada is a member of this organization of states. And this commission, it has the ability to go on site in countries and investigate the human rights situation in a country. And so in, uh, in 2012, the commission came to Canada and, and they came to Canada after NWAC and Fafia had requested that they did, along with some help from the University of Miami's Human Rights Clinic. And the commission came to Canada in March of 2012 uh, for this hearing. And at the hearing, the commission heard about these extraordinarily high numbers of, of women who had been disappeared or who had been murdered. Um, they also heard about allegations of police failures, of systemic discrimination that was faced by Indigenous women and girls, uh, particularly in, in BC. And so after that hearing, they requested information from the, the Canadian government about this uh, situation, and upon receiving that information, they requested, uh, they requested that they could come visit Canada to assess the situation in 2012. And unfortunately, they didn't receive an answer from the government at that time. And so in 2013, NWAC and Fafia asked if they could come back for a second hearing. So the commission came back in March of 2013 and at that point, the Commission publicly asked Canada about its lack of response uh, to the Commission's request to visit Canada and investigate this issue. And, uh, and that prompted Canada to formally invite the Commission to come and visit Canada in 2013 and perform an investigation. And so in August 2013, the Commission visited Canada and it met with dozens of individuals and organizations and government representatives to assess the situation in BC and it later released its report in 2015. And like the CEDAW report, the Commission made recommendations calling for an inquiry uh, as well as calling for action to address the systemic issues that make Indigenous women and girls vulnerable to violence and contribute to their socioeconomic marginalization. And this report and the CEDAW report, they're both mutually reinforcing. They both note the connection between colonial practices and police neglect of uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls files, as well as the connection to the dire socioeconomic conditions faced by women. And they see these as primary factors that result in Indigenous women and girls being disproportionately subject to violence. And again, you can find a, a link to that report in the, the handout provided. So these two reports uh, that were produced by the CEDAW Committee and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, they're really two groundbreaking documents and they're just an excellent example of the results of NWAC and FAFIA's efforts to use the international human rights arena to draw attention to the crisis of violence against Indigenous women and girls in Canada. But FAFIA and NWAC, they have also engaged with uh, various United Nations human rights bodies and Fafia began engaging with these bodies in 2005, uh, and at that time it was submitting reports on the status of Indigenous women and girls in Canada to various human rights bodies. And NWAC really began uh, partnering and, and being an essential piece of these reports in 2011. And almost all of the bodies that we've reported to have made recommendations to Canada on how it needs to improve the state response to ending violence against Indigenous women and also improving the socioeconomic conditions that these women face. And so on this slide, you'll just see a brief history of some of the, uh, the different organizations and human rights treaty bodies that we've reported to. Uh, the slide, it's all acronyms, but if you look on the handout, we've got the full treaty body names and links to those treaty bodies, so you can, uh, can check out the different treaty bodies that are available if you're interested in advocacy work yourself. Um, 
yeah, so between 2008 and 2016, these human rights bodies have just continually made recommendations on how Canada needs to take immediate action on protecting the rights of Indigenous women and girls. And so there is a lot of history of, uh, of an international call for Canada to improve the situation of Indigenous women and girls. And Laura, I'll pass it off to you now to talk about the specific uh, recommendations. Great, thank you, Susie. So uh, really quickly, just one more poll. Uh, we're curious how many of the participants on the webinar today have ever used data or the recommendations from CEDAW, so the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, in your own work, either in an individual capacity or as part of your organization's work. Okay, that's fantastic. I'm incredibly excited that 46% of uh, folks have referred to CEDAW, uh, to CEDAW recommendations or documents in the past. That's that's really wonderful. Um, it's part of the reason I think that FAFIA does this work is because we are so committed to having very strong documents such as concluding observations come out of the CEDAW committee um, so that you know domestic advocates can use the recommendations and use the materials of the, C of the CEDAW committee in domestic advocacy work. So that's really fantastic. And then for those who haven't yet uh, referred to CEDAW, uh, committee uh, jurisprudence or concluding observations in your work, our hope is that in the future you will think to look to these documents and to read uh, what the CEDAW committee has recommended to Canada um, and sort of understand that these concluding observations and these recommendations are indicative of the gap in Canada's compliance with its international women's rights obligations under CEDAW. Uh, so, so very briefly what we have here are the concluding observations, the actual text, this is taken verbatim uh, from the concluding observations document that was released in November 2016 by the CEDAW committee. Uh, so there were dozens of recommendations made about women's rights in Canada in general. Um, this document, I think it was 17 pages long, which is really incredibly long. Generally, concluding observations are about 9 to 11 pages. Uh, the committee made several important recommendations specifically about uh, violence against Indigenous women and girls and the socioeconomic conditions faced by Indigenous women and girls. And it's important when considering these concluding observations that one thinks to prior reporting and recommendations made. So for example, Susie just explained some of the history of engagement and talked at a certain length about the CEDAW committee's inquiry report. And that's absolutely critical to understanding the concluding observations we have today. So for example, at paragraph 27, it refers immediately to that inquiry report and calls on Canada to fully implement without delay all 38 recommendations that were contained within the inquiry report. Uh, and, and, and that's indicative to us as civil society that the CEDAW committee does not consider Canada to, ha to have yet taken sufficient and adequate action in holistically responding to the crisis of violence against Indigenous women and girls um, and taking steps to respond to the violence and ensure that Indigenous women and girls can exercise their rights. Um, okay. Oop. There we go. Okay, so the, the concluding observations are quite long. So upon referencing uh, the inquiry report, the committee then referred to the terms of reference of the national inquiry and reiterated um, issues that organizations such as FAFIA and NWAC, among other human rights, uh, women's and indigenous organizations, um, have been advocating on in various ways. Um, so there are advocates who call for a human rights-based approach so that the inquiry consider indigenous women's and girls' rights um, and, and use some sort of approach to the inquiry um, that considers fundamental Indigenous women's and girls' rights. Um, for the mandate of the inquiry to clearly cover the investigation of the role of the police, uh, as, well as, their, uh, as well as for the establishment of a mechanism for the independent review of cases. Uh, that we also received a recommendation from the committee that Canada ensure adequate support and protection to witnesses uh, and strengthen the inclusive partnership with Indigenous women's organizations and national and international human rights institutions and bodies throughout the course of the inquiry. Uh, the committee then moved in, so there's 
a recommendation or a comment, pardon me, at paragraph 28 uh, of the concluding observations that speak to the root causes of violence and discrimination against Indigenous women. Uh, and then we have these recommendations to Canada at paragraph 29. And this uh, recommendation at 29, paragraph 29A, calls on Canada to develop a specific and integrated plan for addressing the particular socioeconomic conditions affecting Aboriginal women. Uh, it also uh, calls on Canada to implement the recommendations made by the Special Rapporteur on the rights of Indigenous peoples um, following his mission to Canada in 2013. This is referring to the report that was authored by James Anaya. And there was some press in Canada um, around that time in 2013 after Mr. Anaya formally released his report as well as for Canada to promote and apply the principles enshrined in UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and to ratify the ILO Convention. So now I will briefly speak about some key takeaways, one of which uh, is the recommendation that I just um, uh, just repeated at 29A to develop a specific and integrated plan for addressing the particular socioeconomic conditions affecting Aboriginal women and girls. This is absolutely key because in the past um, UN treaty bodies had tended uh, to focus mostly on police and criminal justice failures as opposed to uh, recognizing the issue was one that was multifaceted uh, that also stemmed from socioeconomic issues and the marginalization of Indigenous women and girls. Uh, so it's a, so the violence is a combination of factors, right? It's a result of a variety of systemic factors, root causes of which Jennifer and Melanie spoke about earlier in this presentation. Uh, so we can use these recommendations to advocate for the rights of Indigenous women and girls. Uh, the reports that are produced by human rights bodies like CEDAW recognize the root causes of violence against Indigenous women and girls and identify how Canada is violating international human rights law by not protecting Indigenous women and girls' rights. Uh, and they urge Canada to take action through these recommendations. Advocating on these issues is essential because gender-based violence is an extreme form of discrimination. So Indigenous women uh, and girls are duly at risk for violence because of both their gender and their race. So it's important to understand that violence against Indigenous women and girls is, is intersectional uh, and, there's, uh, and it's the intersection of the gender and the race that predispose Indigenous women and girls to be subjected and targeted and targets of violence. So merely being an Indigenous woman, removing all other risk factors, has been found to be a factor correlating to Indigenous women's subjection to violence, which is not the case for Indigenous peoples generally. It's only for Indigenous women and girls that Statistics Canada has concluded that indigeneity itself is a cause um, that you know, predisposes Indigenous women and girls to, to violence. This is really unique to Indigenous women and girls and speaks to the crisis of violence and how we need to tackle fundamental uh, systemic racism that continues to exist in, our, in Canada today. We must also take into account that both federal and provincial governments are responsible for implementing Indigenous women's and girls' human rights. So a strict minimum of standards is required across all jurisdictions in Canada. Uh, Stolen Sisters, a report by Amnesty International, speaks to this jurisdictional complexity, as do many other civil society reports. Because we are a federal state, there's a division of powers between various levels of government. Uh, but while there's that division of powers, all governments in Canada are responsible to uphold and respect our human rights, including the human rights of Indigenous women and girls. So a province or territory can't get out of its obligations by saying, oh no, it's the feds. Um, all governments have that obligation. So in CEDAW's most recent recommendations, uh, it called on Canada to implement the remaining 37 recommendations from its inquiry. The CEDAW committee pointed, uh, pointing to Canada's failure to implement these recommendations is an indication that Canada is still violating international human rights law. Uh, so the CEDAW committee did not take the, this occasion, its concluding observations, to say, you know, we consider Canada's response now to be adequate. Um, they're responding to this crisis. Um, in contrast, the committee stated very clearly that it does not consider Canada to have acted on the vast majority of its recommendations. And this continue, the continued omission of Canada to act allows us to infer that Canada is still in violation um, of Indigenous women's rights and girls under, protected under CEDAW. Uh, 
Okay, so to make sure that the recommendations are implemented, nonprofit organizations must advocate for their implementation and educate people about them. So we can do this through social media campaigns, through press conferences, through solidarity campaigns such as FAPIA's Step Up for Women's Equality campaign, and by speaking to members of parliament and provincial parliament, for example, taking um, long-term or like local actions but continued over time really makes a difference. So solidarity campaigns such as Step Up for Women's Equality can be used to disseminate reports and related information. This can be done at an individual or an organizational level as well. The more people who are informed about these international human rights reporting organizations and the fact that they found Canada in violation of Indigenous women's and girls' rights, the better. And so individuals, we can cite to these documents as authority. It is legal authority, and we can say that Canada is currently in violation of its international human rights obligations under CEDAW. And this is unique. It's not often that UN treaty bodies will declare a country to be in violation of international law. It generally only occurs after inquiries have been undertaken. So we're in a unique position as advocates to be able to discreetly and explicitly say that Canada is violating international human rights law and needs to improve its response. Okay. So an example of recent advocacy that Safia has been working on is the Step Up for Women's Equality campaign. So this campaign is advocating for the implementation of the CEDAW Committee's 2016 concluding observations. It includes a solidarity campaign that dozens of women's organizations, international human rights organizations, labor organizations, grassroots organizations, and individuals have endorsed, uh, with more joining as word of the campaign spreads. Fafi, along with the hundreds of other individuals and NGOs who endorsed it, have released a call to action letter addressed to the Prime Minister, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Canadian Heritage and the Status of Women, asking them to implement the CEDAW recommendations. We are also working with our local, provincial, national and international organizations uh, who are working towards women's equality by advocating for the adoption of the recommendations. And as part of our advocacy work, um, FAFIA is considering drafting a letter urging the government to implement the recommendations specifically related to Indigenous women and girls, as well as the 37 recommendations from the UN Commission of Inquiry, um, particularly highlighting that the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls should consider uh, not only the CEDAW inquiry report, which, is, which it is mandated to do as part of the terms of reference, but should also consider what the CEDAW committee has subsequently said in its 20. 16 concluding observa observations, where it still um, is asking Canada to take holistic action on the issue and to implement all 38 of its recommendations, not only just one. Uh, so for our last poll of today's session, as we close, um, if FAFIA um, with partners such as NWAC were to draft such an advocacy letter calling for the implementation of Indigenous women's and girls' rights, um, would you be interested in signing on to such a letter and using that letter for domestic advocacy in your own local context? Fantastic. <laughs> That's great. Okay. That would... Fantastic. Okay, so the vast majority of folks um, seem very welcome to that to that opportunity, and I think this is something that we're working on um, in strategizing how best to move forward on on the recommendations. So Karen will be following up um, with you know information about this webinar, including the link to it, um, and then we will subsequently be following up um, in regards to this particular advocacy letter. Um, and in regards to the Step Up for Women's Equality campaign, you can access it via the FAFIA website, and there are these shareables. Um, the Dropbox links is accessible through, on the handout um, through slide 19, so you can actually click on it right now, access these shareables, and you can post on social media um, through Facebook and Twitter with these fantastic images that were put together by the West Coast Legal Education Action Fund, who was a, another women's organization that participated in the CEDAW Committee Review of Canada. Okay, and unfortunately we only have five minutes, but in the last five minutes, if there are any questions, or uh, please, please feel forward to, to ask and we'll do our best to respond quickly. <laughs> 
That's great. Thank you very much uh, to all of our presenters. Um, this is Karen again from Canadian Women's Foundation and I have been sort of fielding a couple of questions as they came in on the question box. Um, the first one that I'll pose is um, do you know presenters if anyone is doing research on the matter of Indigenous women and girls with disability um, in relation to sexual violence and uh, yeah if that's something that you have looked at in your work. Hi, um, Jennifer here from NWAC. I know there is a national body that is working and doing this type of work. What I can do, I'm sorry that I forget the name specifically and the contact information, but I can add that as part of the handout and it can be added to afterwards. But I know there is a specific group putting that together and that NWAC in the past has participated as well. Yeah, and this is Lara. Um, here and so I, I'm not aware of specific of a researcher who is specifically uh, researching the issue of Indigenous women and girls with disabilities and their subjection to violence. Um, however, I do know that there are people who are actively reporting on the issue of women and girls with disabilities more generally in Canada right now because Canada is about to come for review under, before the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and this will be our first time ever being reviewed by that treaty body because Canada only ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2010. Uh, so there is a National Women's Disability Network, DAWN, Disabled Women's uh, network um, and actually Bonnie Brighton who's the executive director of that organization is on the board of FAFIA so I can be sure to ask her if she's reporting specifically on Indigenous women and girls um, with disabilities. Unfortunately our data, our, this is Statistics Canada data, this is like you know Canadian data is very bad on issues of persons with disabilities more generally. They generally don't necessarily disaggregate by sex and also not by gender, or pardon me, by, by race. So it's, it, it actually can be extremely difficult to try and understand the rates of violence against Indigenous women and girls with disabilities specifically. Um, but in any case, but I, but I can also provide that information similar to Jennifer and hope to provide um, a better answer. <laughs> Great, thank you for that. Um, the next question is actually um, uh, about intersectionality in the analysis that goes into um, the work that you do. Um, so um, the question is um, how do you apply an intersectional analysis when you're preparing these reports um, or when you're coming up with your advocacy positions? I think the, the biggest way that we, we try and uh, implement an intersection intersectional approach is by reaching out to other organizations. I think particularly with FAFIA, uh, we take an intersectional approach in all of the work that we do and I think a big part of that is partnering with all of these other amazing women's organizations who specialize in specific areas, whether that be with Dawn or with Women with Disabilities or with NWAC who specializes in First Nations issues or uh, uh, different Muslim women's organizations. I think by by reaching out to all of these amazing organizations that work throughout Canada in these uh, more specific areas and then taking all that information and merging it together in order to create our, our documents and reports is a, is a big part of how we ensure that we have an intersectional lens and approach to our, our reporting. Mm -hmm. And I, I think an, 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 another um, another way in, in which we do our best to to include the intersectional analysis uh, is is by being very clear that you know women are not just one homogeneous group in Canada that there are many different you know different groups of women who have different issues and particular needs. Uh, and to be very to be very clear about that, and the UN treaty bodies are also very clear in their interpretation of their articles, um, and using the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in particular, um, they have a general recommendation on women with disabilities, and they have some very good text on sort of intersectionality and understanding that you know gender-based discrimination is just one layer of discrimination that disabled women have to face. There's also you know discrimination on the basis of ability, and if one, for example, is Indigenous woman, there's also discrimination on the basis of race um, depending on religion there can also be you know so there are just these are these, these intersecting um, discrimination that sort of builds up over sort of, well can amplify as opposed to builds up but amplifies and really means that that individual can be further and further marginalized within society um, and so while because of FAFIA's capacity um, 
we tend to we can report just generally on women in Canada. What we will then often do is be very clear that there are certain groups, like groups of women in Canada, who are disproportionately marginalized or subjected, and then we list like the various groups um, that that are considered to be more are more vulnerable and on the basis of their intersecting and multiple forms of discrimination against them. Um, but there are some amazing organizations like the African Legal Clinic. They do really good reporting. There's a Southeast Asian Legal Clinic who also do really good reporting. I mean, not surprising. Um, the organizations of racialized, more marginalized groups tend to not have capacity to do this reporting. So they're, you know, so we do our best to reach out to sort of our allies and organizations that we work with to make sure that our reporting is as, um, I would say, so as representative as possible. But then, you know, we're all facing our constraints, so we ultimately do our best. Um, and in the instance that we don't actually have an individual who herself has various identities who, who for herself, potentially, like could be someone who has experienced an intersection of a variety of discrimination, um, then we will reach out to someone who may identify as such and ask them to review the report as well, um, so that those people with lived experiences of, of discrimination um, are also reviewing uh, our materials and okaying them or editing them as needed. Great, thank you very much everyone. Um, it looks like we are already at the top of the hour, so I don't think we'll have time to take any more questions at this stage, but if there are questions, um, you could always email them to us and uh, I'll make sure that I forward them on to our presenters. Um, so thank you, first of all, to all of our panelists, Jennifer, Melanie, Susie, and Lara. Um, that was really informative and comprehensive, and uh, I think it gives folks a really great idea of, of what it is that you're doing and how they can uh, support you uh, in that work and uh, to take on some of uh, that advocacy as well. Um, and thank you uh, to everybody who participated today. Um, just a reminder that we do have another webinar session coming up uh, on March 30th, uh, so you can look in your email for um, registration link uh, in uh, the next little while. And uh, I think that that's it from us. So thank you very much for joining and uh and we'll close it there. Thank you.